Hello and welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. I'm your host Chris Collins, back in studio once again. The state budget season is finally complete. The governor and the legislature have come to terms on a budget, including a number of vetoes that were overridden by the legislature that affect several programs, including a couple near and dear to the heart of my guest today. He is Northwestern DA Dave Sullivan, making his first appearance on Beacon Hill Update. And uh, Dave, a lot of things uh, that the governor decided to veto, like I said, the task force, your anti-crime unit. I mean, he took the, the Ginsu to that budget, a budget that was already sent to him balanced that I know we talked before when the vetoes were first issued, and you weren't entirely happy, you must be very relieved today. Very relieved on Saturday that uh, two of the major overrides came through. Uh, first, the uh, opioid task force that's really a national model, and you know, Senator Rosenberg and Representatives Kulik and Mark and, and Whips Lee and, and the other folks in Western Mass really banded together to, uh, to override that veto. It just didn't make any sense, and I think you expect more out of a governor's office that they're going to make intelligent cuts, not blind cuts. And I think what the legislature had done early on was to make over $200 million in cuts to balance the budget. And so fortunately, we have some very strong advocates in the legislature out here that we're looking out for Western Mass and for the people that benefit from our opiate task force, not only the people addicted, but also their families and their community. Can we really expect anything from this governor other than his, what his predecessor did? Because what he did was pretty much the same thing that every Republican governor in the last 25, 30 years has done. They took uh, a knife to a budget that didn't necessarily have to be cut. I understand that there's concerns about revenue and that a potential fiscal crisis and where we're down on tax revenue, we had a three quarters of a billion dollar structural deficit. But it seems like to cut those programs, especially with all the talk he's done about the need to deal with the drug problem, didn't make a lot of sense and was really, I think, cuts into his credibility a little bit on that issue, does it not? Well, particularly with the other part of the budget that uh, he vetoed, you know, it was almost 3% of my DA's budget, which we're really trying to do not just the prevention side of things, but also active prosecution and drug trafficking. And, um, you know, I think the governor uh, really had a good first year, and I hope that the administration um, keeps its humility in check, and that is that listen to your legislators, listen to the folks that are uh, on the ground. And, you know, when you need to make cuts, do it in collaboration, but don't do it unilaterally like what happens. So uh, hopefully it's a lesson learned for the governor. Uh, I've enjoyed working with the governor on uh, domestic violence and sexual assault and issues, on uh, ch child abuse issues. So the governor has done some really good things, but this was a rather boneheaded move uh, on his administration. And, and hopefully he's had time to reflect and say that, you know, if we are going to make cuts, let's do it in collaboration with the legislature. You are one of the political heavyweights, I like to call you guys, that helped form this opioid task force. And it's become a model, not just in Massachusetts, but around the country. There are other states that are watching what's happening here and are going to town on some of the moves you've made. So it's, you've got to feel good the success that you've had so far with that organization. It really has come together, and it's because it's community-based. It's it's people uh, saying, hey, I don't have all the answers, but let's come up with some collaborative solutions. And I'm going to be heading down to Arlington, Virginia, to really talk about uh, our task force and some of the work that we've done with prescriber education. Uh, Ruth Poti, uh, doctor from Valley Medical, has been phenomenal. We've taught over 600 pharmacists, prescribers, dentists, whatever, uh, about how to safely prescribe and how to make sure that people get pain management without becoming addicted to pain medication. So, um, so and part of it is just that sharing. We've shared our information with uh, the Hampshire Hope that uh, has been started with Hamden, with Worcester. Uh, it's really been an open uh, door for people to, to learn from uh, what we've gained in knowledge. And I have to say that um, it's really the medical community that came together and created the healthcare solutions uh, that's really made a big difference because essentially addiction is a disease and the overprescribing is a medical issue and, and how we've been able to kind of come to grips with that I think really made a difference. It's interesting how the dynamic has changed with regard to the approach to drug addiction. It used to be, no, it was a crime and punishment issue, throw these people in jail, throw away the key, and you have people doing time in, in jail for drug convictions that, by today's standards, they would have rather, or probably more likely, have gone into treatment than gone into jail. And that, does that make your job tougher? I mean, or, or is it something that you welcome as a prosecutor to not have to focus so much on, on the crime and punishment aspect of this issue? 
Well, it's smart policing and smart prosecution to look at the roots of crime. If we get people into treatment and recovery, we can reduce the crime rate. There's no, there's no need to break into cars or homes or uh, rob convenience stores or banks to support a drug habit. So it's really in everybody's self-interest to really get the best recovery and treatment services possible. And there was a dearth of uh, those facilities in Hampshire and Franklin and North Quabbin, zero beds. So now we're up to, I think, 64 in Greenfield. There's some more coming on in Petersham. So it's really about smart policing and smart prosecution saying, hey, how do we help people overcome their addiction as opposed to trying to incarcerate our way out of it? So uh, the, we're 48th in the country, the 48th on the low scale of incarceration, which is really good, but we can do better. And Massachusetts has really become a model for reentry. And it's really, if you don't help people either before they get to jail or while they're there with reentry and rehabilitation services, you just have this revolving door. And I'd rather see the pie of our state budget go toward education, go toward uh, human services, go toward um, needs that need to be met with poverty rather than. Uh, continually deport into the criminal justice system and see no results. I think we all know the saying is uh, when you do something over and over again and you expect a different result, it's called insanity. Well, I think the same thing with criminal justice. How do we kind of come up with models? And I think the models that we've created in New Hampshire, Franklin County for law enforcement, also with drug treatment and recovery, and uh, it really, I think, become a model for the country on, on how we uh, take the stigma out of it so people actually step forward and get treatment. And, I mean, treatment is very, very important, and I, I, I get you on that, but there still has to be a crime and punishment aspect. You still have to go after the bad guys that are dealing this junk, which is why that veto of your anti-crime funding was so important. For people who don't know what that unit does, describe to me what your anti-crime unit is dedicated to doing. What we did about three years ago, through a state grant, in fact, was to create a crime task force that takes law enforcement from Franklin and Hampshire County and our Mass State Police, and they work together on major cases. Number one, uh, drug trafficking. Um, there were communities that didn't have a single officer that they could spare for narcotics investigations, and now we bring together uh, eight communities, uh, and it includes all 47 that need help, but eight communities that work with our Mass State Police to come up with really good investigations and then the prosecutions to really take the major dealers off the streets. So whether it's in Athol or Greenfield, Northampton, Amherst, it's really to work together. And it's that collaborative approach. We have a wonderful uh, you know, leader in our Mass State Police, uh, Detective Lieutenant Cummings, who really runs a great unit and they really know how to work with the locals. I don't think there's any jurisdiction where Mass State Police and locals work together so well. And I know that that task force, just the number of busts you've done just in the last six months, it's been amazing. I, mean, I, don't know, I haven't got a count on exactly how much, um, many drugs you've taken off the streets, but it's got to be in the hundreds of pounds and grams. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's that, but it's also the impact of the quality of life in a community. If anybody has ever lived in an area where there's a drug house down the street, and people know comings and goings, and, and not being able to send your kid to the local corner store or to school with fear that they're going to go by that house, to make that neighborhood safe again, is a huge accomplishment. So it's it's hard work. It sometimes takes months and months to build a good uh, case, but it's well worth it in the long run because we're going to try to get rid of these major drug traffickers and then the people that use uh, drugs. Uh, we have a a model program for a drug diversion and treatment program where if somebody is in possession, they have an addiction issue, uh, we're going to try to get them into treatment and right into treatment that day in court and so then we can get them out of the criminal justice system and hopefully turn that life around so they're not uh, a frequent flyer in the court system. One more question about drugs and then we'll move on to another topic, guns, which is big in the news right now. You've got all this effort to try and encourage people to get treatment and you're trying to work to get drugs off the streets and now you're confronted with the likely passage in the fall of a ballot question to legalize marijuana for recreational use. As a law enforcement guy and a guy who knows more than the average bear about addiction and addiction issues, does this scare you a little bit, the idea that pot will become able to be used out and open like tobacco? It should frighten people on the teen brain development alone. Uh, the marijuana today is anywhere from four to ten times stronger than it used to be. It's addictive, it's a psychoactive drug, and the impact on youth, those are from the ages of 10 
to 21 should really frighten people because uh, the impact on teen brain development and on teen motivation and people moving forward. So there's a huge impact that uh, legalizing marijuana will have. Um, I'm really upfront. I was for medical marijuana for legitimate illnesses. I was for decriminalization because I didn't want anybody caught with marijuana to have a lifelong record. Uh, but this is the third step that I think has gone far too far. Um, Colorado is experiencing an enormous amount of difficulties uh, with impaired driving and also with teen dropout. And uh, right now in Massachusetts, the average age, or the mean age, I should say, of initiation of marijuana, first time use, 12.8 years. Wow. So we're talking about your fifth graders uh, starting marijuana. And again, it's a psychoactive drug. I'm not saying that alcohol or tobacco uh, don't have harmful effects, but really what it is, uh, is listening to our pediatric uh, specialist, our medical specialist, and saying that the route to um, legalizing marijuana can really create long-term lasting impacts to people's brain development, but also their futures. Um, one of the folks that have really spoken out about uh, looking at um, you know, marijuana legalization uh, is Dr. Rouse out of Providence Hospital, addiction specialist, also Dr. Ruth Poti, and it's really making intelligent choices. So when people go to the polls, don't judge it by the marijuana you might have known, which was 2.5% back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Now we're talking 10 to 20%, and the dabs, the concentrates, 80 to 90%. Crazy. It's just outrageous, and uh, just a small amount of that. And then they're putting all the THC into gummy bears, ice cream. 55% yeah. of all the marijuana products sold in Colorado are edibles. Talk about an attractive nuisance. It goes back to big tobacco. How did we market tobacco for candy 50, cigarettes. 60 days? Yeah. Candy cigarettes, but also Joe Camel. It was all, um, one of the things with addiction that I've learned from Dr. Poti and others is that addiction starts early. Yeah. It starts at 10, 11, 12, all the way through the teen years. And to even defer anybody's use of alcohol, tobacco, marijuana until they're, you know, 19, 20, 21 is a major accomplishment to avoid addiction. And really, what's addiction costing our country? Trillions of dollars between alcohol, marijuana, opioids. So um, I'm a big proponent of saying, um, let's not go that third step. I think it's a, it's a very destructive step for communities. Um, and impaired driving, right now we don't even have a way to test for uh, marijuana um, intoxication other than maybe looking at somebody's eyes and looking at their uh, particular driving. We have at least an OUI breathalyzer, but we don't have anything to really detect marijuana. And uh, those uh, rates of impaired driving have gone up tremendously um, around Colorado and Washington and other states that have legalized. One of the things that I was amazed when I spoke to Ruth and she, we were talking about this issue, she said that she's got kids coming in now for whom heroin is their first drug of choice. Usually, you know, growing up in, in my, my generation, it was booze, pot, and then the harder stuff. But there are kids coming in now that are hardcore addicted to heroin because they got painkillers from someone when they were younger. And, and it, it, you know, marijuana alters your brain, but nothing alters the brain more than those heavy opiates, yeah. and that's the real problem. And there's pathways to addiction. It doesn't take really that long to get addicted to opioids. And you know, part of it is that the brain gets rewired. And, and that we didn't know about the, the teen brain uh, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even the last 10 years have been incredible amount of knowledge. And, and that pathway gets changed by opioids. And it becomes uh, really a lifelong illness that people have to overcome. So, and, and it's that root of, hey, I, I'm going to take the opioid, I'm going to snort it. They don't get the same effect. And then it's, it's again, back to accessibility and access uh, to heroin. It, you know, you can, I can drive out here today and go and buy heroin probably as easy as I can buy a six pack if I was in the reach. And so, it's cheaper. It's cheaper, yeah. The, the bags uh, that are being sold out of Holyoke and other communities is anywhere from $3.50 to $5 a bag. So. Um, you know, it's, it's sad to think that you can buy uh, a bag of heroin cheaper than you can get a six pack of beer. Let's switch gears and talk about guns. Uh, the Attorney General recently put down an edict that essentially says that assault weapon, copycat assault weapons, are included in a statewide ban on regular assault weapons. And there's been some 
back and forth. I mean, guys like Steve Kulik, we've had on this show before, uh, has come out against the AG's ruling, saying it's an overreach and that it should be that this should be a subject of legislation. But you, if I'm correct, you supported that decision by the AG to, to add those weapons to the ban. I guess I'd like to have you explain why you feel that was a good idea. Well, the Attorney General is the Chief Law Enforcement uh, Officer for the Commonwealth. In addition, she interprets the laws of the Commonwealth. She's the people's attorney. And it wasn't creating a new law or new regulations. What it was saying is that copycat uh, and duplicate uh, weapons were always prohibited. And what's been happening is that there has been no enforcement tool or no enforcement agency that's really looked at this. Um, the folks who certified that these were compliant were the gun manufacturers. They would stamp mass compliant on it. Well, really, it's not about taking away people's Second Amendment rights, which I truly respect, and, uh, but it's to say military-style assault weapons. Just because you take the suppressor off or you rearrange the uh, piece of equipment doesn't take it. The, the weapons that are being targeted are AR-15s, AK-47s, and they're being sold, but they're stamped um, you know, mass compliant, and that's just not right. And so the AG has stepped in, and she was motivated by these mass shootings, particularly Orlando and Dallas and Baton Rouge. All three of those involved assault weapons, and they should not be in the hands of civilians. If you want a military-style weapon, join the Marines. But these weapons were clearly banned under the um, Clinton administration expired in 2004. Massachusetts came in in 2008. So it's not, it's just saying, hey, enough is enough. And it's not taking away a single weapon. She made this perspective. There isn't any retroactivity to her enforcement letter. So if somebody's bought one of those weapons as a duplicate or copycat, it's not to say that we're going to take your weapons away. So I think it's a reasonable enforcement letter. Um, just so you know, all the dealers have stopped. It's, it's almost universal compliance because they know, they know that that weapon that's an AR-15 or an AK-47, they know it's a copycat or duplicate. So one of the things was to send this out so you didn't have the feeding frenzy of selling these weapons too. So I know it caught, caught some people off guard, but I think uh, it's a good enforcement letter. Is there not a second amendment implication? I know that when we talk about banning any kind of gun, you're going to get people are going to say, you know, the Constitution says we have the right to keep and bear arms, and any, anything, you know, the word shall not be infringed, you know, that's going to rile some people up. I would think that there'll be a legal challenge to this, and, and that may end up putting this sort of back on the shelf. But should there not be a law subject to a fair and public process by the legislature put in place to clarify this rather than just an edict from one individual? Well, it, it, the law was passed in 1998, so it was the people, the citizens, through their state representatives that passed that law and state senators. Uh, so this is a clarification, which the AG does every day. Every law that comes across uh, her desk or her assistance desk gets clarified. So if they feel that that enforcement law is overreaching, then they should sue the attorney general and say, hey, why isn't this AR-15 that looks like an AR-15? Sounds like an AR-15, shoots like an AR-15. Why isn't this an assault weapon uh, ban? And, and really, the ban took place on the federal level. It expired under a sunset clause, and now it's moving forward. So the citizens of Massachusetts, um, they passed this law. And now it's a matter of the attorney general giving an enforcement. And uh, I, what, what we've requested as district attorneys is a list of these weapons. What are you exactly saying is banned? You know, it's not antique pistols or anything like that. So I think clarity um, from the Attorney General's office on what, what are these weapons that you're really targeting? And it's not about um, hunting or fishing or any of the foul, um, you know, weapons, shotguns, nothing like that. So, but we don't want to infringe unlawfully on people's right to bear arms. And, and uh, I'm a proponent, and obviously we're from Western Mass. I mean, our... Um, you know, folks that are hunters and, you know, really, you know, want to have firearms um, in a legitimate way. Um, and we have very low rates of gun violence here in New Hampshire and Franklin County. I want to keep it that way. I guess the, the question I have whenever I hear about a, a law like this is, is it going to keep it, the guns out of the hands of bad guys? Our bad guys are still going to be able to get 
their hands on these weapons. Isn't it, isn't it sort of making sure that <coughs> legal gun owners can't get these kinds of weapons as well? I mean, is it going to really uh, impact the ability of the people who would, would cause harm, real harm in this society from getting those weapons? Let's take three examples. Newtown, if there was an assault weapons ban in Connecticut, that individual wouldn't have been able to create a massacre of 20 children and six educators. Uh, if we had had an assault weapon ban, uh, we'd still have Dallas police officers alive. Uh, it's about a military-style weapon that can shoot an incredible amount of rounds of uh, bullets within a short amount of time. So, um, obviously, uh, we need to do a better job on mental health checks. We need to do a better job on felony checks. Um, you know, uh, people do have the lawful right to protect their homes, and, and certainly there are weapons that have been absolutely uh, protected under that Second Amendment and, and should continue to be protected, but it's been, uh, you know, gone, it's been enforced through the courts. Uh, these assault weapon bans uh, are legitimate. They are a legitimate and reasonable, common sense way to restrict, um, you know, military weapons from coming into civilian society. So, you know, I think it's a balancing act that's been struck by our legislature and, uh, you know, with the uh, Attorney General coming out with this enforcement letter, uh, it's long overdue. We shouldn't have allowed the gun manufacturers to be the enforcement agents. I mean, what other industry would you, you know, have? It's like asking the liquor business to say, geez, we're going to set the rules of the game or we're going to tell you which vodka is legal, which vodka isn't, you know, so. Or how old you can be to buy said vodka. Right, okay. so, um, but you know, I think that it caught people off guard you know, because it had lingered for 18 years, and, and uh, I was shocked to find out that uh, there were over 10,000, you know, copycat weapons that were sold last year in Massachusetts. I, I was really surprised. I would have thought 100 maybe or 200, but, um, you know, and, uh, you know, you, you want to make sure that these uh, mass shootings uh, that happen with assault weapons in, you know, Orlando, I mean, just look at that tragedy. Um, that was an assault weapon that should have never been in that person's hands. And uh, the, the other is that, uh, you know, the fact that we as a federal government could not restrict people on the terrorist uh, no-fly list from getting assault weapons is just outrageous. It's yeah. just simply um, so stupid. I, I don't even know what to say. And, and it, it wouldn't be to say that somebody wouldn't have due process rights to say, hey, I shouldn't be on that no-fly list, but as a bare minimum. I mean, don't sell that weapon until that person, you know, can show that they, why they shouldn't be on that no-fly list. And, and that, um, you know, you had Kelly Ayotte, who was putting on a, a real dog and pony show. She's not for, you know, that restriction, but she's trying to get reelected in New Hampshire. And, you know, and, uh, it became a political football, which it shouldn't be. These are, uh, these are people that, um, you know, terrorists should not be able to, to come to America and buy weapons. One more thought before we wrap up, we have a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to get uh, a little bit of an update on the Children's Advocacy Center. You guys did a good thing putting that together. It's now open for business in Greenfield. It gives a safe place for kids to go and tell their story, victims of child sexual abuse. Um, it took a lot to put that together, but you got it done, and uh, a, a great thing for the community, I think. Yeah, I can't thank the community enough for really coming together, and I think between uh, donated labor and supplies and donations, uh, about $200,000 worth of goods and services and donations. And now we have a beautiful house in Greenfield that's for all of Franklin County and North Coabin. And, and we're seeing kids every week. Um, the sad part is we need a house. Yeah. Uh, but the great part is they've got a safe and family-friendly place to come and tell their story. And, uh, you know, a lot of kids leave just feeling like, wow, the weight of the world's off my shoulders. I was finally able to tell somebody about what happened to me. And many times, you know, young kids can't remember who their perpetrator was, but to be able to, A, be believed, and to be able to get that off their, uh, their minds and their, uh, their hearts is, is really important. So I can't thank the people of uh, Franklin and Hampshire County who really, in North Coabin, that stepped up and, and really made it the, uh, the kid's place. And it's a real kid's place for, uh, for everybody. Up until that point, kids were shuttled around to police stations, the DA's office, to three or four different places. Now they can be in one spot in a comfortable environment to tell what you know is the worst thing any kid can tell, which is a story about being molested or abused. Yeah, it's so important for uh, for it to be done in a 
family-friendly way, but also in a really good non-leading way that it's up to them to tell the story and, and to make sure that we get accurate reports. And you know, if we can prosecute that, that's really important for us. But the most important part is that that child and that family that gets impacted begins to heal and start, starts moving on. And uh, you know, it's just great to have a, a spot like that. And they don't have to go down to Springfield or um, to UMass Medical. Uh, in Worcester for examinations anymore. There's a, a phenomenal uh, doctor, Dr. Boos, who comes in and does the medical exams. And you know, he's based out of Bay State in Springfield. And he, he makes his trip up here two times a month so that kids don't have to be displaced and, and have that uh, medical exam in a very unfriendly uh, op operating, or I should say emergency room somewhere down in an urban place. So, so it's great. We got it right in our backyard. It's a great thing that you did. And uh, I know that you said that the community really came through and that's that's what it's all about it's all about the community and doing the right thing for the people none of it elected you but that your neighbors were. we got great neighbors here I, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else uh, you know Hampshire and Franklin counties that I represent I couldn't have a better district it's just uh, it's about community coming together and that's why our communities are safe people care about each other and uh, you can talk about guns you can talk about police the most important thing is when communities care and they care about the safety of their schools, they care about the safety of the neighborhoods, and they're willing to call, and they're willing to, to be active and engaged. And, and you know, one of the things is just making sure your community um, is welcome to everyone, but also that, that you're engaged and, and you're there to make sure your neighbor is safe as well as your own family. We'll leave it right there. My guest has been Northwestern DA Dave Sullivan. That's Speaking of Update. Thanks for watching. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.